Call this meeting in order. Stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you have any electronic devices, cell phones, please silence them. Happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. The first order of business will be the uh, approval of the last uh, meeting's uh, minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes of the last meeting? If not, I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes. So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Three ayes. Department heads, this uh, this particular month we are uh, uh, we've asked all our department heads to come, and uh, as far as any business they may have, but uh, just to tell a little bit about your department. Some of our departments, such as the animal shelter, they don't get here very often. So just to tell a little bit about yourself. So the first will be Mr. Bill Gray. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to. First of all, thank all the commissioners <coughs> for the kind words and the visit here on the flowers. I appreciate everybody the walk out for the cards. Sorry for your loss. Thank you. What do you, I don't know, what, the, what do you want me to do? Uh, song and dance, but. <laughs> <laughs> can't dance, can't sing. Um, nothing really, just uh, just tell a little bit about what you do. And, yeah. um, do you have do you have anything specific for us? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I, I'm playing catch up right now. Well, it. Mr. Gray, let me, let me, if I may, Mr. Gray takes care of five different county buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, everything from the courthouse to the jail to the annex to the animal shelter to uh, community, correction. community corrections. And uh, there's just him and his helper. And uh, he does a lot of things. He uh, takes care of our heating and cooling in here in the building by remote, by computer. He monitors things on weekends and etc. Uh, he and Jeff are rather invaluable, I think. So, uh, and, and I mean that. Everything from being here at 5.30 in the morning to shoveling snow while I'm still asleep. And uh, and I do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I don't have anything else, so. Commissioners. Thanks for all your work, Bill. Thanks for all you do, Bill. Thank you. It's a good time to ask for a raise, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong board. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Corum. Richard Corum is our highway superintendent. He does an excellent job. He's just returned from road school along with the surveyor and Commissioner King. Oh, and a stint uh, of a week in Florida, too, I might add, but yes. please. Go ahead and score them. Uh, I put you on the spot. Heck, I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> we take care of your roads. That's all I can say. Uh, I can tell you what we're doing now is taking Please. care of our uh, gravel roads for this going on the second week. We've been putting a lot of gravel down. Things are thawing out, and we got roads out there blowing out. I've got a crew out patching. It's going to take a while because the thawing, de thawing thing is going to happen for a while. Got a crew out on Sykes Road today. We got a really bad spot out there, soft spot. We have to dig it up, put a new base in it, yeah. and uh, fill it up, pack it down. We'll do more as little things start warming up and getting better out. But uh, yes, we're pretty busy right now. I'm doing catch up too since I've been gone. Um, got some places marked for putting some new culverts in, waiting on them to be located so we can start putting some of them in. It's gonna be a busy spring for us. Just so the people know, tell how many tell how many employees you have. You got about fifteen, I believe. Fifteen employees. Thirteen, fifteen, something. Like we that. have. Uh, Is it fifteen? Fifteen. How many yes. trucks and vehicles? Jeez, oh, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> how many? How many? We we purchased three years ago. We purchased uh, seven. Five. 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 Five uh, uh, trucks for uh, yeah, dump, dump trucks. 12, 10, um, 2, I'm going by the numbers on the trucks. Everything's orange, so it's <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 
three. I think there's three tandems, three single axles. No, two tandems and three single axles. Okay. They've been doing really well. We definitely needed them at the time that we got them, and we sure work them. And the roof is on the new building? Yeah, they're and waiting to do the concrete now. They're getting things ready, I do believe, today to do the concrete they're in there right now. So okay. Okay. Looks good. Everything's been going good. Okay. Everybody's getting along. Everything's going good. So. You have any questions of us? No. Unless you got more. Commissioner? I did. Yes, Mary, I'm sorry. Are we, are we planning on uh, resurfacing any rooms this year? Is oh, that in the budget? Well, yeah. yeah, we are. Yeah, I mean, we, we can't do a lot, but... What do we, we know which ones those are, Richard? Got to start out on them, yeah. But I got a list down there at the shop, so... I'd like to do a little bit uh, more hot mixing this year, too. We've got some dips here and there. Throw a truck off to one side or another. So it just depends on how much money we got to use. Okay. Try to do the best we can and help everybody out. No, seriously, everybody down there does a great job. I know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Jim? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, basically, I'm the chief probation officer and uh, a little background on the department. There are nine employees, three are clerical, six are probation officers. We have two juvenile officers. The rest are adult officers. Um, we do everything from pre-trial supervisions. Juveniles, we do everything from beginning to end. We get a report, we interview, figure out what to do, um, take them to court if they need to go to court, and then obviously we provide probation supervision after they've been put on probation. Um, last time I was here, I had stats. I'm actually going to have updated. Uh, I'm required on a quarterly basis to make reports to the State Department. So probably at the next meeting I could give you better <coughs> statistics as far as how many people we have on probation, how many are felonies, how many are misdemeanors. It's overwhelming. I think last time it was around 600 people. So you average that 100 people per probation officer which actually it, it's not evenly distributed the way we have it set up right now. So it's, it's a daunting task. Uh, we have three probation officers involved with the drug task force right now, or the Carnersville task force. So um, that's been successful in my book. I know we've done over 100 field contacts or home visits because we've had law enforcement available. We got uh, armored vest recently because of that. We're getting firearms training this Thursday, actually. So we're moving forward as far as that goes. I don't know if there's anything else you want know about the department. Um, I am on the agenda, too, for something else. So I don't know if you have questions about the department in general first. I think you kind of cover, you do work for, for uh, Judge Butch, am I correct? Right. Our supervising judge is Judge Butch. So she's basically hiring, firing, <clears throat> discipline, that type of stuff. Although we do provide services for Superior and Circuit, and our job is whatever the judges want, is what I tell my officers pretty much, whatever they request. Um, with the number of people we have, I'm really pushing to be able to use technology more and we have made a lot of changes in even a six month period um, and getting used to it. You know, we switched to Odyssey like everyone else. I just had um, the lady that did the training come back yesterday um, <clears throat> to further <clears throat> go over areas. We were more worried about getting every case in because we had over 600 cases. Um, yesterday was to kind of look at all the different features of Odyssey so we can start using those more and be more consistent with that. We've gotten a web-based direct testing random program where a computer actually um, decides who's going to be randomly tested so it's not up to the probation officers to keep up with. We have almost immediate access when the results come in. Um, I know we've done over 200 screens since November 1st on that. So there's other areas I'm hopefully later today meeting with the gov pay net and that would be able to accept credit cards in the um, probation department for uh, probationers to be able to pay on their fees. Right now they call 1-800 number 
and it's, it, it goes through that. They don't use it as much because they have to call the 1-800. We would actually have a machine available there for them to do it. So I'm working on trying to use technology as much as possible because we're just overwhelmed with the number of people. Do you, do you still do uh, pre-sentence uh, recommendations? We, yes, we where do. Where you actually take a person's history and, and, and mm -hmm. any other information and make a recommendation on sentencing to yeah. the sentencing it, judge? It's pretty detailed. Lawrence Smith is the main person that does the pre-sentences and it's a um, web form that we use through the state. There's a requirement for every, um, I would imagine even an easy pre-sentence takes at least an hour to just input in the <clears> computer. <throat> then we've got, we look at legal histories in other states and you know, we have some people have 20 arrests, and we track those down to find out the outcome. So that's the major part of the pre-sentence is getting the legal history. But, yeah, we do quite a bit of those. That will be part of my statistical report, too. I do count in a three-month period how many pre-sentences were submitted to the court. So I'll be able to give you a more accurate number at the next meeting. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to see if you had any, any questions. Any questions? No, very impressed with the work you've got to do and the way that you're handling it. Thank you. My intent is to kind of share the information so the general public knows what work we do um, and understands how sometimes they give us more powers than we actually have. You know, that we, we cannot go arrest people. Um, there's certain things that I think, you know, the general public misunderstands about what our job is. So I'm trying to get out there what, what our responsibilities are and, and what we're trying to do to, to make sure that we're doing everything we need to do. And thank you very much. Well, the number of people that you handle and take care of is just awesome. And to be responsible for that many individuals, even though there's six of you, a hundred people, per person mm -hmm. is a lot to keep track of. Anybody that's got a kid of their own or yeah. their own family trying to keep up with them stuff, but a hundred of them's another story. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, my other um, one was on the agenda for today. I did give a 30-day notice to PBS, which was our previous case management program, which we had had for, I think, 16 years. Uh, my request is um, we no longer will need to input any information, we have completely switched to Odyssey. However, since we have 16 years worth of information in that system, uh, I'm requesting to have a read-only view. So if there's an old case that we need to go back and see what happened or see the probationer's notes, um, they did um, provide um, an agreement that my understanding would need to be signed um, by the commissioners as far as our termination agreement and um, can be done in a matter of weeks, I think. I did give a copy um, to Chris. Actually, Orlin gave you the copy to review. I think everything's in order. I had Mike looking at yeah, um, how to go about doing that. I've told him to get with Mike because I wouldn't be of any help, so he's aware of that. Yes, um, Ms. Turner provided the adequate notice of termination and, and the termination agreement calls for a read-only version, which she just explained. And basically, just so you can view the cases, right. but you can't access them. Correct. We can't change anything in the information. We can only view it. And that, that's for a fixed, a fixed rate? Yes, and that was for $1,000, a one-time payment of $1,000 to convert that to a read only. Right now, we're paying $203 a month uh, until we get that terminated. That's our maintenance fee that we've paid for years. And I mean, the notice was as provided in the contract, and this right. termination agreement would just be agreeing for the read only flat fee. I mean, it sounds like it's necessary to yeah. be able to access the system that you used for 16 years because this is because they switched to Odyssey back, I think, last year. Last it was November year. 1st, I think we actually switched. Is, is the view only something, is it a separate contract that yeah, we I mean, it's approve? incorporated into the termination agreement. Okay. And I mean, I it's perfectly fine. It just needs your, your 
signature as president or your guys' approval and signature. Okay. I think mainly what they're wanting the uh, contract is that we're not going to use their software any further um, because they do own the rights to the software. Um, I think that's the whole point for them wanting the termination agreement. Okay. And this this thousand dollars is coming out of your funds. Yes, I budgeted for it. I'm down to the wire. I need to get it in um, this month, or I'll have to ask for a little bit more money. But I think I'm going to be okay with that. Having said that, do uh, we need a motion? Given the information, on, uh, I would entertain a motion that uh, we approve the uh, termination of the contract and the uh, view only uh, part of it. I make a motion that we terminate the contract with this company and accept the fee for the view only services. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the termination and the view only section of the contract. Question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Three ayes. There you and go. And I don't think, did I give you a copy of the actual agreement needs to be signed? I do not. Do I that. want to leave? I'll take that. And, and then once it's signed, you'll need a copy. copy so I can send it to them. Put that in your box. Perfect. Who's Thank you it? very much. Who's um, the contract? Um, it's PBS Paperless Business Solutions is what that stands for. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Next up, our IT director, Mr. Michael King. Morning. Um, I'm the IT director for the county, but I'm also the IT director for the city. So I have, and I'm guessing here because I've never actually done a count, somewhere around 200 computers and another couple hundred devices between the network devices, cameras, and everything else that goes along with the system that we use. Um, I don't really have anything to report from the last couple of weeks. I've did something in my back last week. And I went to the doctor yesterday, so. My productivity level is going to be down until this gets taken care of. Um, I, I am, do have some meds that I'm taking. I'm supposed to go back next week, so I'm hoping to get this taken care of. Currently, I'm to the only employee. I had a part-timer till about two months ago, and he's now got a job in, at Copeland and Rushville, and then uh, I've been looking for another part-timer. I gave the uh, application for the guy I'm going to, I want to give a chance to try out um, to you guys this morning. His name is Michael Wilhelm. Um, He's worked in tech support the last pretty much about five, six years. His previous employer gave glowing review, no problems, and he seemed to know his stuff and be willing to learn. Um, and he's more than happy with the part time. So I think he's the one that I would get along with best and, and would get along best with people in the offices throughout the courthouse. So. I know I have to go to the council to get the uh, 144 for the next meeting for them, but I, uh, Mr. King, uh, the commissioners are usually in here sometime through the week in the evening for a meeting, and Mr. King works well past his required hours, usually not leaving here till seven o'clock in the evening. So if your productivity is down a little bit, I think you paid it forward enough to. To, uh, for us to understand that and being responsible for not only 200 computers but for the systems and everything like that uh, I think the counties and the city are both getting their money's worth having said that you need this is your recommendation yeah um, and he has passed all the requirements I sent the information to Terry for the background check for 911 um, I haven't heard back from her yet but since the meetings not for another two weeks or so for council I have time to get that back before I um, take it to them so okay well then we'll at our next meeting uh, we'll just go ahead and prove that in the morning unless okay. there's a problem and if you will just remind us and we'll hold on to this that's fine any questions for me um, <clears throat> how much how much work would you say you've been doing since you've lost your part-time job it varies um, been busier than normal been busier than normal because it's kind but it's kind of I mean I, I liken it to the police department or the fire department it's feast or famine one day I could have three or four mm -hmm. calls and those days allow me to catch up on things other days I could be running from one office to the other all day long so so we, so we definitely need 
you know, a full-time and a part-time person at the county with the way technology is today. Yes. And in the demands upon the instant access. And, and contracting because is just not feasible. You're going to spend more in contracting than you would if you just had a Plus, there. you never really get ahead. Um, I view the, the IT job as, as a threefold thing. You've got maintenance and repair, which is the, the you know, if something goes down, you got to fix it. You've got improvement stuff, so you want to make things better. You don't want to just stay at the same level all the time. And you've also got a lot of research you've got to do, looking for new security exploits, new things that have to be covered, new viruses. So there's a lot of, of little things that when you're stuck putting out fires all day that you don't get to. So on the days when, I, when you have fewer calls, you can get to those other things, trying to improve systems to fix things and, and get ahead of the game. So, Because a, a contract-based service is just an, an IT service and that's it. They don't do repair. and, and They would, but you they have to would, but you have to call service. them every time. Right. And you have to know what you're asking for. Right. So I'm just trying to make the Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, th I think one thing a lot of people aren't aware of, though, is that uh, for instance, uh, community corrections, they they communicate by computer, by email, by yeah. excuse me, by the net with uh, the DOC in Indianapolis. I think on a pretty much regular basis, a lot of the information that we collect here is forwarded to state agencies by way of computers. Uh, and we, then you have stuff like the, the uh, community corrections where they have the ankle bracelets; those report back to us over electronic systems through email and through internet. So. A lot of those interactive systems, they have to be up all the time. So, okay, Michael. Yep. Thank Thanks, you. Sir. Appreciate it. Next up is the animal shelter, Mr. Ellis McQueen. Well, thanks. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just started up there in January, January the ninth. Um, January's kind of been a blur to me. There was a lot to do up there. And, uh, it's a busy place, uh, a lot busier than what I thought it would be. Um, February, uh, we had 19 dogs adopted out, six kittens and one cat. So that was pretty good. Um, January, we were pretty busy with that too. Didn't have quite the numbers. <clears throat> we averaged probably anywhere from 10 to 12 dogs. and cats are unbelievable on how many we keep a week but um, and that's a real problem so um, I, I have a couple of things this is my first commissioners meeting so I'm not sure what meetings I'm supposed to be bringing up what so if I, I apologize right up front if I bring something up I shouldn't um, I didn't know if this would be the meeting where I ask uh, to change some things up there um, is that appropriate? Go ahead. Okay. Um, the way we're doing it right now, uh, we have, if somebody comes in and adopts a dog or a cat, what they'll do is they'll, they'll pay for their shots. They will pay a $5 fee to the animal shelter. The only thing the shelter gets is that $5. Um, shots are pretty expensive. And the problem that I run into is uh, when you go to adopt that out, somebody will say, well, I, I don't really want to pay that much. I can go somewhere else. And the way it's always been in the past, to my understanding, is we give a receipt, they pay us, we give them a receipt, they take the receipt to Dr. Key Faber, he gives the shots, and then Key Faber sends the animal shelter a bill, and we submit a claim and pay for the shots with the money they gave us. Um, what I would like to do is also include in that Animal Care Alliance, which is up on 40, just outside of Centerville. Um, they've got a great program going there. It's considerably cheaper. For example, if you adopt a cat today, it's gonna to cost you $60. And that $5 goes to the animal shelter, $55 for shop. If I go to Animal Care Alliance, I can get uh, a female cat and spayed and all of its shots for 35 if it's a male cat I can get it neutered and all of its shots for 25 
If it's a dog, it's $60 spay or neuter plus all of its shots. So I can actually get the spay and neutering in that for the same price we're doing now. And that's a big goal because right now <clears throat> the cats is unbelievable what we have in the area. They're, they're everywhere. They're feral cats. They're breeding tremendously and that means you're not going to see a big change in that immediately but if we can get people to start spay and neutering now um, in a few years you'll start seeing that and there's some programs I think you can put in place um, you can you can take a cat having neutered clip his ear so you know which cat it is put it back in actually put it back into the community and they'll stop breeding in that area that controls that a little um, so I would like to be able to use Animal Care Alliance um, if it's okay with you guys. Is that? It sounds like a good plan to me. Have uh, you talked to the local doctor to see if he could match the prices or would be good? Um, as a matter of fact, I, I did call him and uh, I called him probably a week or two ago and I just received a call back from him yesterday and I'm to meet with him Thursday morning at 8 o'clock. So, yes, I, I, I want to talk to him. I don't know how he can compare with this. Uh, I, I'm not trying to, you know, take business away from him. I know, you know, last month was probably really good for him. We we took in a thousand, I think a thousand and thirty dollars on adoptions. So you got to figure the majority of that was going to the veterinarian. So um, the business is, is way up. So, uh, but you still have to think, uh, for example, years, I guess for years up there, they have charged $10 for a deposit for spay or neutering. So basically what that person does when he adopts, he gives that $10 and then that goes toward a deposit to get spay or neutering done. However, from me going back and checking records and stuff, the majority of those people are not, not taking advantage of the $10. They're just losing the $10. So why are we charging these people $10 for something they're not doing anyway? You can't make them do it, but if I can get that price down to, to you know, $25 for shots and neutering of a cat compared to, for example, I had a lady the other day who wanted to adopt two cats. It would have cost her $120 to take those two cats out of that office. I can send the same two cats to Animal Care Alliance plus get them spay or neutered and it cost me half the price or cost them half the price. So. Uh, you know, you got, it's just like a business, you know, you got you to gotta keep looking and searching for the right prices and, and make it fair and equal to everybody. Sounds like a good plan because you say you can stop part of the reproduction, that'll stop part of the problem. But you're also, your adoption rate's going to go up because, I would think, because you're, you're paying less. I mean, some people, I mean, in a sense that... People still have to take care of the animal when they adopt it, but um, it makes sense to, to get a cheaper price if we can do it. I All, think also with the Animal Care Alliance, <coughs> uh, I think what we may start doing is uh, we're like the, the Parvo and Distemper shots. I can, I can get them through Animal Care Alliance uh, for like $3 a shot. They'll order them for me. Uh, we've talked about that. Uh, and I can just go up there and pick them up. We can, we can start a. We've not done this before. It's not been done in the past. But we can, we can start giving the vaccination when the dog comes in. Now, obviously, if you have to euthanize that dog later, you're losing three dollars. However, if you euthanize that dog or cat when it comes in, your disease control at the shelter goes down to almost zero. It, it controls that. And we haven't had a problem since I've been there. There has been problems in the past, according to, to the employee that's there. But uh, 
not a major problem, but uh, uh, I think that's a, a good thing to put into place. Else, I think the things you recommended, um, if you would put them down into writing, and just you don't have to appear at the next meeting if, unless you want to, but put it in writing as far as excuse me what you want to change it from and to, and the policies and procedures. That way we can we can approve it in our meeting and make it make it official. Uh, one other thing, uh, you and I have spoken. Uh, you are doing everything you can to uh, adopt the animals out. Uh, you are putting animals on Facebook, uh, doing everything to keep from having to euthanize and keep our kill rate down as low as actually possible. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, and I, I did forget a couple of things. Um, that that was one of them. we we have started. Uh, putting all the animals on uh, Facebook, and that's worked out really well. Um, what we've been trying to do is, if we pick up a dog or a cat, a stray, I try to get that on there as soon as possible to locate the owner, and that's that's worked out really well. Uh, I talked to Michael here uh, recently, and uh, we we started March the first with a. a computer program. It's all been done with pencil and paper. Uh, we started that March the 1st with a, it's kind of like a tracking um, of the animals and the owners. Uh, we got a system now where we enter everything into the computer and uh, it'll let us know who's got what dog and where they're going and, and how long we've had them. And it's, a, it's a great program. It's working out really well. Uh, it'll take us we got an awful lot going on up there right now, um, and it'll take us a while to get that, you know, going really smooth. But I, th I think it's going to work out really well. We'll be able to, to uh, for example, I had a, a guy bring in a dog, and, and he dropped him off. Says he had some hardships and, and wanted to surrender the dog, and, and I, you know, I felt kind of sorry for him. And then he's back up there. You know, a month later, and I didn't really recognize him at first. But he won't. You know, he's there to adopt more dogs. Well, if you can't afford to take care of the ones you just dropped off, you really shouldn't be dropping off or trying to adopt more dogs. So, if you got had that computer system, I can pull that back up and I, his name or the animal or whatever, and we can say, okay, here's here's the pattern. And you have that. That happens occasionally. Uh, somebody will come in, they take dogs out, they, they breed, they bring dogs back, and they sell puppies and make money. Uh, it happens. So we can control that. Okay. Um, but the computer system is going to work out really well, um, I think. Thank you. Um, the other thing is. Uh, I would like to try to start with some volunteers up there. That is a, it's an extremely busy place. Um, if you do it right, uh, and I'm sure you want it done right. Um, it, you know, the phone rings constantly. You got animals to take care of. You got the property to take care of. Uh, you know, you're, you're going out, you're picking up dogs. You're, you're taking care of people that brings dogs and cats in. Um, there's there's been a lot of times when we would go out on a call um, we would come back and somebody will set a box of cats in front of your door or they'll turn them loose up there and they'll be in the trees uh, they'll tie dogs to your doorknob you know uh, I don't appreciate it I think it's disrespectful but that's what they do um, but you really we need some type of uh, control of that and I think the only way you're going to get that is um, have more people we're going to have to have volunteers or a part-time person or both I would like to have both uh, that I've, I've talked to a lot of people about volunteering if we could just get you know somebody there to help like answer the phone so we can take care of some other stuff um, it, it would that would even help a lot can I, I did I uh, check with our uh, insurance carrier. Uh, that is permissible. Uh, 
they need to be on a master roster so everybody so they know who's actually volunteering and who's being covered and everything like that. And I think you and I discussed that they would not be allowed back with the animals where they could be bitten or anything like that. Am I correct? Right. Okay. Right. Um, I don't think we really, Dave and I can handle, I think, the animal part of it. Um, it's just if, you know, if I've changed some policies up there, number one, uh, no, neither one of us go out by ourselves to get a vicious dog. If we got to go out on a call on a vicious dog, both of us will go. For example, the other day we went and got one. It took both of us like 45 minutes to get that dog corralled and, and put in the truck. And that was a vicious dog. Um, it's not safe to let one guy do it by himself. Um, when we euthanize, um, they've done it in the past with one person. That's a no-no. We don't do that no more. It has to be two people there, one side or it don't happen. Um, we do a lot of mowing up there. We haven't yet, but uh, we will be. And can't have one person up there mowing by himself. You flip a tractor over or whatever. Uh, that's that's not good policy. So I've changed some policies up there, and the policies are going to require two people. And if we if we got you know some volunteers to answer the phones and talk to people when they come in. To let us take care of some other things, that will that will free us up a little bit. Um, the other thing with that is uh, you probably need to consider a part-time employee or a full-time. Either one, full-time would be great. Um, we probably could get by with a part-time employee. Um, you got vacation. You know, when one of us is on vacation, that leaves one person. Um, it, it, just doesn't work. I mean, you kind of, kind of got to look at it. You get what you pay for. I, I can make that work, but it, you're not going to get the, the efficiency of the, the shelter like it should be uh, without that. There's just, there's just too much work there. There's a lot. That's a, that's a busy place, and I welcome any one of you to come sit up there all day with us. It's, it's busy. It, it keeps you up. And can I make? It's a suggestion that you said that people come up there and they tie dogs to the door handles and stuff like that. Is it possible that we could get two of the square outside kennels, put them somewhere and with a sign on it, where if somebody has to surrender a dog while there's nobody there, they can put one dog per kennel. Don't put two dogs in there. I, I mean, I don't know if that would work. That way they're not tied to the door handle. And you come back, and there's a dog in the kennel. At least it's it's in a kennel, and and we we do have one kennel that is open for law enforcement. If, for example, after hours, uh, if they run into a problem and they they get, they get the dog corralled or whatever, we have one open for them. I, I and this is just just my opinion of it. I, I don't think that would be a good idea. Um, it's just like anything else, it, you know, if you let somebody just start bringing dogs up there, you're opening the door for everybody just to start bringing. And if there's one already there, somebody's going to open it and put another one yeah. in. Then you got a dog fight and then everybody's upset because they say, okay, you let two dogs get in a fight and one gets hurt. So I don't think that's a good idea just to let, kind of let them have the run of that. And the second thing with that is I think we need to be documenting who, who's bringing what. I want to know who's bringing what to me and, and what's going on. It, you know, if, if the dog, it's a responsibility. I, I mean, it sounds probably senseless, but owning a pet is a responsibility. And, and you just, if you're going to take a pet, be responsible for it. Don't just have an outlet to come up there and dump your dog and say, I don't want it anymore. You know, somebody's got to feed it, the county or whoever, so. People are still going to do it. They're just going to dump their dogs off up there. I mean, What's that? Do you have a lot of that where they just dump them off? Oh, I think cats are the worst. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, the, it sounds gross, but it's true. I, I went to work the other morning, and I have a dead dog laying in front of my door. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I don't appreciate it. I think it's disrespectful. Uh, but that happens. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
you, you about have to have somebody there when you're at least when you're open you know you about have to have somebody there all the time but the way we're doing things and and uh, we're trying to make it a better place we're trying to make it a, a friendly place and and open I, you know I invite everybody I can up there that's how you get dogs adopted and find good homes but uh, you got to have somebody there you got to have people somebody's going to run it well I think if uh, you get us something in writing and about what you want to do and the changes and everything like that and then let us know what uh, your, how your meeting <coughs> excuse me Dr. Keith Aver turned out and uh, hopefully we can get you something approved pr pretty quickly okay. okay one other thing is our hours of operation are from 8 to 4 uh, Monday through Friday and the way we're, we have been doing that we're open 8 to 4 Monday through Friday um, on Friday one of us takes off at noon whoever takes off at noon on Friday works from 8 to noon on Saturday so um, our busiest day up there is Friday afternoon that seems like you know probably people getting paid or whatever but that's when we adopt out most animals and um, that's that seems like that's when we're the business what I would like to do is instead of being open on Saturday morning, we stay open until six o'clock on Friday evening. And we would, what we would do is, we would do basically the same thing. We would alternate who does that Friday till six. For example, whoever uh, works till six, he'll come in at ten and work till six. And then the next week, the next Friday, the opposite guy would do that. The regular guy would come in from eight to four. So that would extend our hours on Friday. Um, a couple hours and I think that's our busiest time Saturdays really aren't all that busy um, occasionally you'll you'll get some but Friday seems like it's a busy day I'd like to be able to change those hours okay I see no problem with that if that's when you're busiest and you don't have people coming in on Saturday it makes would, no sense for you to be there we would still be up there on Saturday to clean okay. and feed then okay. Saturday and Sunday, but uh, uh, we would just actually just be ex instead of being open for the actual business hours, would be extended on Friday and closed on Saturday. Include that in there and we'll do this a package deal. I, that's that's pretty much all I got. I appreciate your time. Any if anybody questions? got any questions, I'll be more to answer that. Happy to answer. Them. Appreciate what you're doing. Very much so. I know you've done a lot of hard work up there. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. County Attorney. Um, do you want me to just give a general yes. overview of my yes. I'm Christopher Appel. Um, I work at Bay Codwell here in town. And I also have the honor of being the attorney for the county commissioners and county council. I do a lot of things behind the scenes, review contracts, negotiate contracts that the county is going to enter into. I um, draft ordinances, deeds for the county. I advise the commissioners and council of any legal questions they might have, whether it be a potential issue with an employee, an accident that could bring a lawsuit. I work with the auditor closely to make sure that the, uh, all proper notices are followed as far as the Indian open door policy goes. Um, the lawsuits filed will often be the first person to appear or respond and then notify the insurance and work with the uh, other attorneys who are appointed to update the commissioners on the progress of any litigation. Um, basically just anything you can think of that could is a legal issue that involves the, the county commissioners or county council, and then in turn, any employer department head will eventually come to my door. I, I like I like the position. I'm happy to help and be of any assistance to not only commissioners and council, but any of the department heads who might have an issue that they think I can help with. And besides, for the contract that Jenna brought before me, which I reviewed, and I agree that it's the 
sort of uh, termination agreement with Paperless Business Solutions is fine. It also incorporates the read-only version that she mentioned. I didn't have anything else um, that needed to be presented today unless someone had a question for me. Thanks for putting up with us. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Mr. Pell. Adrian Ellis. Mr. Ellis is our EMA director. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <coughs> uh, bring some money in. I have uh, two Homeland Security grants. There's a timing issue here. I'm sure you're well aware of the issues at the federal government on budgeting and such. And there was kind of a, a hold up there. They did approve budgets and everything for Homeland Security, but it did throw the grant cycle in kind of a little mixture there that they didn't know what to do. And then once they got the okay, everything went forward and I had to do it quickly. But I have two grants. One is the annual reimbursement to the county for my submissions to the Homeland Security. And that is $17,538.47 that will go into the general fund. That is one grant. To achieve that, there are deliverables that I have to meet, training, education, response activities, plan developments that I have to submit to Homeland Security, and my membership on uh, Homeland Security's task force all goes into that. The other grant is a hazard mitigation grant that is for eighteen thousand dollars. I want excuse me for yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. Given the news that uh, I read the other day about the uh, uh, project in Kokomo, uh, has the federal government, what I read, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that's why I'm asking, they've suspended uh, hazard mitigation funds to the state of Indiana in a, all over the state because of that project? Yes, any project that's not divine, defined right now, these were in the process before any of that happened. Okay. Um, I'm really still trying to wrap my head around that. How does something in Kokomo affect the entire state? That's just FEMA flexing their muscles. They were told not to do it. It's a flood control project that I don't know the dynamics of it, but what they basically have told Kokomo, don't do this, Howard County. They've told them it's going to create problems downstream, and any project for flood control is something that not only has an effect on your county, it can have an effect downstream. For us, when I'm doing flood control projects and looking at potential flood, one of the things that I'm doing is monitoring what's going on north of us. So I understand their logic, I just don't understand how they want to punish everybody else. So at this point, I know there's a lot of litigation in that. So hopefully, uh, some things that I'm looking at, it's until we get that squared away, it's probably going to fire us. But these dollars were approved Before. prior to that that hold on everything. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. That's perfectly well. Um, so I don't know if you want to look at. I will need signatures as we always do and approval. If you want to do one at a time or do them both. Uh, let's for to save time, let's just do them. Just tell us what you got and okay. we'll approve both of them. The second grant is $18,000. Um, that will pay for a year of Everbridge. Super. So there's uh, some money we don't have to put out. So basically, 17000 18000 uh, dollars <coughs> in the bank. And uh, basically, we need your approval, and then I have my usual signature pages. Okay. Um, before we do that, for those who, who are listening, uh, Mr. Ellis's department is rather like an insurance policy. You pay for it and hope that you don't ever have to use it. Uh, but in the event of an emergency, whether it's a local or a statewide or a national emergency, whatever, his office kicks in with. Uh, 
not only resources but communications and uh, uh, consultations with other officials and, and uh, in the event that we have a situation here that requires federal uh, disaster funds your agency also coordinates that am I correct yes sir okay so the department is some most of the time rather out of sight out of mind but it's an extremely important department and as I said it's kind of like an insurance policy you have to pay for it hope you never need it but if you do it's there is that is that an accurate statement yes uh, one other thing has changed um, I'm a member of Homeland Security's Task Force 6 um, I'm a strike force team leader in the past we've had a situation where my task force went to Hurricane Sandy the, the task force went to Hurricane Katrina and the Henryville tornado. We provide uh, several elements, fire, medical, law enforcement. Uh, my strike team is psychological first aid. I work with a lot of victims and survivors. Um, oddly enough, I probably work a lot more with responders than I do victims. And I just went through a counseling session helping the EMT that we were up all night uh, having some severe issues. Uh, a lot of people, and Frank, you're well aware of this in your background law enforcement, you will have to see a lot of things that people normally don't. And in some of the worst case scenarios, this particular person was on an ambulance, and I got to be careful because I'm covered by HIPAA laws, I can't say the wrong thing. But basically, there, to me, there are two kinds of ambulance. There's a transfer and there's a trauma. There are people who go pick someone up and transfer them to the medical, and then there are people who go to a horrible scene. This person had never been to a horrible scene. And the assignment was for Hurricane Sandy. And thinking it was going to be just band-aids and such, it was for body recovery. And bodies that have been in water for a long time. There are a lot of horrible things that people have to deal with and then they take it home and then they have to deal with it and it compounds and the next thing you know they're fighting a lot of emotions and at three o'clock in the morning I get a phone call. Uh, that includes law enforcement officers. There was a double homicide in Blackford County uh, not long ago that I worked with some people there to try to help them through that. So there are a lot of things involved that people never see and it's a long list. So it's an honor to do it. I'm very proud to do it for the county, and it's all of us working together. That's the key there. So having said that, I need your approval and signatures. Appreciate your work. Uh, tell us again what the uh, uh, grants are for. The um, two grants, uh, hazard mitigation grants, is uh, eighteen thousand dollars for. <clears throat> Excuse me, use forever bridge. It's spelled out in the grant agreement. I left copies in all your offices. And the other is reimbursement to the county for my submission as a documentation and response to Homeland Security. They reimburse the county for my actions. I actually did read these, but I left them in my office this morning, so. It's okay. What was that other one? 19,000. 18,000. And. 18 plus, 17,000. $17,538.47. How they got the 47 cents, I don't know. The board's uh, heard Mr. Uh, Ellis's uh, explanation. Is there a motion? I make a motion that we sign these and approve these grants. Is there a second? Second. A motion and second to approve the uh, hazard mitigation grant and the reimbursement grant. Is there a question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Three ayes. We'll, we'll sign these at the end of the meeting and okay. get it back to you. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'm thank right. you. And thank you for the work you do. Thank you, sir. And uh, I'd like to add something. Yes. I think it's one of the best guys we've ever had back here. Mr. Yes, I yes. think he's a very good guy. I think we did well there. Yeah, somebody left the glasses off. Ms. Dudley?
Um, the first thing that I have on your packet there to report is that the Indiana Department of Corrections was here February 18th for our annual site assessment and we scored a 96 out of a possible 100 on that so I'm really proud of my staff for the job that they did. Uh, that's for the grant <coughs> that actually rent, that we run off of the $854,000 grant and the follow-up to that is that we have a grant review hearing scheduled for the end of April in Indianapolis at which time uh, the board will go over our grant application, the site visit, uh, along with some other documentation uh, to approve the 2015 through 2017 grant. And I believe they'll be sending contracts back with me at that time for commissioners approval and signatures. Um, the next um, packet that you have, and I put a red number one on the top. The first document that you have back in December, I asked for permission to apply for a TANF grant that we were one of the few counties selected on that grant. Um, we did, I did send a letter to them that we were interested, that's the number two, the next uh, copy, and then number three, they wanted additional questions answered as far as what we would, services that we would provide. I was actually notified last Tuesday that we did, and that's number four, that we did receive that grant. Um, it is a TANF type grant to uh, cover anyone that qualifies for TANF in the areas of uh, life skills, marriage enhancement, uh, living skills so that, that they become less needy for tax dollars. The grant I asked for $180,000 for the first year of the grant and it appears that it was approved and that we also received $20,000 uh, for parolee services for parolees. So I have to form some community partnerships. I met with Jenna last week to get probation involved. Um, I also met with the sheriff last week to get some rehabilitative programs started in the jail some parenting uh, programs, the Inside Outside Dad program. Yesterday I met with the Hope Center to partner with them for child care and parenting classes. Uh, I kind of got my eyes opened up down there. I didn't know that the Hope Center offered as many programs as what they do. They've got from birth through the teenage years parenting classes cooking classes, craft classes. Um, so we're gonna form a partnership with them and with the Cradles uh, department down there to get childcare to keep our kids in school that have children also for furthering the education of some of our people that would are going to Ivy Tech and IU that possibly need childcare, transportation. So that's something that I'm working on. Uh, I have no staff at this time. My staff is bogged down with our current caseload, so it will be creating some jobs through the grant too. It is a, a reimbursement grant, which I'm not had any experience with. I've sent some questions into him on how we go about this. Uh, one possible way is for me, I believe, to get my advisory board to maybe set up, transfer some funds out of my CTP or project income, and so we'd have a pool to work with for reimbursement. Um, if, I, if I may, just uh, one of the reasons we have the departments here today is people who are listening can maybe get a little more uh, information as to what their departments do. Your department, in addition to uh, keeping some uh, people who have violated the law working and providing for themselves and their families. Uh, these grants 
uh, go a long way toward uh, education. Uh, many of your people uh, uh, work on GED, some of them work on college classes. Um, you do, these grants are for to maybe target uh, family problems and try and help people to learn how to cope with this. And I'm telling you, even though we have a grant writer, okay, this kind of stuff is, is very involved, very, very uh, meticulous. And uh, when you're talking about the state or the federal government or whomever gives you $180,000, uh, you have to dot all your I's and cross all of your T's. Am I, am I correct? Yes, I have to have quality assurance measures in, poli in process for any programming that we offer. I have to uh, keep st statistics for their gender, their race, their age. Um, I have to have stats and they have to be reported to the state. I also have to have evaluations in process for the programming that we offer. Uh, this particular TANF grant is aimed at pr uh, strengthening marriage formation and maintenance of a two-parent family, job skills and retention for inmates with kids in the home, and uh, prevention and reduction of out-of-wedlock pregnancies, which you wouldn't think would fall under community corrections, but um, obviously it does, and we to cover all those areas, we need to be collaborative with our other agencies and uh, get some agreements in place, uh, the MOUs in place that, uh, to, for an understanding of what we're going to provide to like the Hope Center and what we're going to get in return. We'll be uh, sending some of our people up there for programming and we'll agree that they're going to provide their st statistics and keep records uh, that we come up with together to measure the effectiveness of the program. Okay. Do you need any action on our part this morning? Not yet. Okay. Um, we were just notified last Tuesday and it actually said that the grant went into effect March the 1st. So. I'm just trying to get some clarification from the state on the proper way to handle it and uh, how they want us to go about it and work with, I'm already meeting, like I said, with the other agencies, try to get our policies, get us all on the same page so that uh, we're not duplicating services, that we're all on, you know, going to go for the same programming and work with each other, referring our clients back and forth. Okay. Uh, the last thing I had there was the cover page. Uh, you've got a resume and an application there. Uh, I would just like approval to put those two in my hiring pool. I believe uh, the one on the application, I'm going to get a hold of him this week if you approve and see if he'd be interested in part-time work and I have an appointment set up with the other one. So basically you haven't extended an offer of work yet, but you just want this Correct. approved in the event that, that he is available? Yes. Okay. Is there a motion? I make a motion to approve the two applicants, Douglas Gill and Dale Tool. I that right? Um, for your hiring pool at Community Corrections. Is there a second? I'll make a second. There's a motion and a second to approve okay. the two uh, applicants for corrections officer that uh, Ms. Dudley has presented. Question? All those in favor signify by say aye. Aye. Three ayes. Thank That's you. It. Thank you, Michelle. Is our council representative here today? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Ms. Diana Wright, who uh, is our community grant writer, can't make it today. She is in the middle of an audit of some kind. So we'll go back to old business and Ms. McCarty.
submit another uh, invoice uh, claim to the county. We do have another address that is completed. So we're moving forward uh, really well with the housing grant. Um, also, we have located three uh, new applicants. We have verified their income, and um, we had to uh, fulfill a certain income level, and uh, which was 30% uh, AMI, and um, this person was at 30.26, so at the last meeting I had brought to you guys uh, a modification to the grant um, to allow this person to participate. Um, so we did get that approval, and uh, that has been signed and sent back to Indiana Housing. Um, so we are moving forward with the three new applicants. We have um, uh, environmental phase two that has to be completed. Uh, we have um, developed a scope of work. We have um, in income verified all three applicants. So uh, today I am bringing um, determination letters which we have to do a historic review of each property that is part of the phase two environmental and we have come up with determinations per address and um, that we would like for the president to sign this will be submitted to indiana housing along with the environmental review pages that are um, documented and with their scope of work um, we will be scheduling the lead risk assessment within the next two weeks and any issues that's brought up with that has to be uh, included in the scope of work. At that time, we will have the finalized scope of work and we will send the phase two environmental in, which will include these two determination letters. Okay. And hoping after they respond to us and approve the scope of work, um, we're hoping to possibly uh, bid out those three addresses and rebid one of the addresses from last time um, in April. And I wanted to bring up also another issue that we're looking at. Uh, there was a local contractor that was awarded bids, two bids. Um, it is a requirement to have workman's compensation for his employees. This particular contractor is a sole proprietor, uh, which workman's comp is not required for sole proprietor, but he has to get an official certificate from the state of Indiana stating that to be able to participate. Um, we have been working with him for two months, maybe a little bit longer. I know that we know that he has submitted the, the uh, application to the state to get that certificate, but he has not received it. I think he could have been a little bit more aggressive on this. So we just want to make you aware that if he does not get the certificate, we may be coming back to you and to deal with maybe going to the next bidder okay. on those two particular addresses. Along with that, we'll be talking to the homeowner because if you go to the next bidder, this price is going to be higher because he's not a contractor. Mm -hmm. So that means that they're not going to get as much work done. Right. Right. So we'll be talking to the homeowner too to let them know, you know, you're not going to get as much work done as we went to the next contractor. But he kind of, this contractor kind of threw us a curveball here that we're trying to work it out with him. But uh, we can only go so far because the homeowner was calling me wanting to know when the work's going to be done. He said, We're trying to protect you guys. Then, well, he can't do any work until he gives us the right uh, certificates. So, uh, if you don't have something by the next meeting, we'll pipe all the next contract. Okay. In reference to these termination letters, so I'll entertain a motion to allow me to sign these. I make a motion that you sign those for the work on those other three properties. Second. Motion and second to allow me to uh, have on behalf of the commissioners to sign these termination <coughs> letters. Question? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Three ayes. We'll get these to you. Uh, do you need these right now or are you going to? 
if, if that's at all possible, um, if you could just sign maybe the top three and give those to me and... We'll actually need to get some copies from those. There, there's copies included. Are there? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. said just the top three? Yeah, yeah, that because the rest of them are there's a copy for the for okay, you guys. Actually, the there's a copy for each one. Yes. Okay. Well and just wait and sign them all. That way she's got <laughs> that way you don't have to worry about it. That's right. I guess I should have sent a top copy of all three. Will you be to attend the next meeting regarding the certificate from yeah. one contractor mm -hmm. to present uh, that or not to? So, right. It depends on and what date is that meeting? What's the April seventh? April seventh. Yes. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes. Okay. Shai. Mr. Shai, tell us who you're with, please. Um, I'm with the Children's Bureau. Okay. Um, we've been here for eight plus years. We offer prevention and intervention families to children and families in need. Um, we also work very closely with the Department of Child Services. And that's why I'm here today every year. Every year in April is Prevent Child Abuse Awareness Month. And we put pinwheels and signs up in the courthouse uh, lawn and back again this year to ask permission to do that again. I don't think you're going to have any problems with that. Okay. Jamie, uh, we, we put them out front uh, before. We Last year, I think we put them out to the side. Um, do you have a preference where they go? or You can put them both places. If you want. Okay. Um, I don't have a date yet. Uh, Department of Child Services, every year we also put on a... Um, Oh, uh, a remembrance uh, and a celebration uh, uh, for families. Um, about an hour, hour and a half um, last year, um, uh, the judge was there and we had um, a young lady came and sang and, and it's a little presentation. Oh, there were about 50 people there last year. So I get more information about that and um, DCS sets a date. I'll let you guys know when that is and hopefully we'll see some of you there. It'll be in the paper as well. May I ask a question? Yes, please. Mr. Shai, could you just explain what the pinwheels represent? Um, that's a great question. Um, ribbons are for everything anymore. Mm -hmm. So they got away from the ribbons and tried to do something else. And pinwheels uh, were a representation of children and their youth um, playing and having fun as opposed to worrying about things they shouldn't have to yet. Okay, thank you. My daughter's actually the DCS liaison for uh, Centerstone, and I'm a retired police officer, so I I understand completely your the concern and, and how important what you guys do. Is that Megan? Yes. I was in a meeting with her yesterday. Yeah, we, we talked. So absolutely, we work a lot together. So. Thank you, sir, and, and just feel free to put them out wherever you want to. Okay, uh, they'll go up probably March 31st, and then we take them down uh, the last day of April. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Patron concerns? Mary? <laughs> Can't we just do this setting down, Frank? No, the camera. Mary and Dalrymple, Orange right right Township right. Trustee. Uh, I have two subjects to talk about. I uh, last week called uh, Commissioner King about the uh, cemetery board. There were some questions I had about that. I haven't had a chance to talk to her because she was away at school, road school, and uh, and she had some things to look at on the cemetery board about the uh, 
uh, mowing contract uh, that we have which consumes about 90 to 95 percent of the monies that the uh, council give the cemetery to board to work with this year and then the other one is uh, uh, the article I read in the paper about our service representative our VA gentleman Bobby Smith uh, I think maybe all of the facts were not in sight when that article was written written uh, I know personally I've, I've had some dealings with uh, Mr. Smith uh, as I am a veteran and uh, I know that he has a limited amount of hours to work. I know he tries to spend as much of that time in the office so he's available to everyone. But what a lot of people don't know and Mr. Smith failed to mention when the news examiner come over to visit with him and, and discuss his job was that he spends a lot of time on the road and I know this personally that he spends a lot of time on the road going to veterans homes because they cannot get to his office he spends a lot of time on the road between here and Richmond taking the same veterans to the hospital to the medical facility at Richmond so uh, sometimes when he's not there it's because he's somewhere else helping a veteran and he spends a lot more more time than what he actually gets paid for and uh, I want to bring that my knowledge of that to the board of commissioners that because uh, he got ripped up pretty hard in the paper maybe he deserves some of that but he surely doesn't deserve all of that I mean, because can I make a comment to that Please. sure um, <clears throat> Bobby Smith is normally closed on Monday in his office I was in there yesterday he was in there with a veteran talking to him working on his issues um, Bobby Smith works 25 hours a week or 28 I think I think that's his set a lot of time I think he works more than that and not that I'm speaking for all the commissioners but we were well aware of his issues why he was either absent or not here it's not like he just disappeared and we didn't know um, he had some personal issues he had to take care of his house caught on fire last summer that's been an issue had some uh, issues with the personal issues I'm not going to go there um, but I'd like to think we're going to handle this piece by piece and see how it works and uh, talk to Bobby and I'm sure there's going to be we've already been informed that there's going to be some people coming here to talk to us about it and there's a petition and whatnot and I think we'll just take it one step at a time and see where it goes um, I, I, along that line I think people understand he works 28 hours a week because he's classified a part-time employee when the Affordable Care Act came into effect Obamacare if you will okay anyone who works 30 hours is entitled to benefits so our part-time employees we gave ourselves like a two-hour cushion there so that we didn't get tangled up with having to pay benefits for a part-time employee Mr. Mr. Smith is a part-time employee. He doesn't work 40 hours a week because the money's not there to pay him for 40 hours a week. And he has been out of the office due to uh, he was laid up and gone because of medical reasons. His house did burn down completely, am I correct? By the hole upstairs. The hole upstairs of his house did burn down. And uh, I've been in his office. I've seen the calendar on his desk of names and different colored markers where he uh, has interviewed or met with or had an appointment with so-and-so. So, -and -so. so uh, uh, to quote uh, Commissioner Doerr, I'm sure we will address this problem in our April 7th meeting, which according to the paper is when uh, the petition will be presented to us. But uh, it's not as if he is uh, not paying attention to his job from everything that I've seen. <coughs> but when the people present their petition and, and their complaints, we will listen to them as objectively as we know how, and uh, we will take care of the problem at that time. Okay. I just wanted to put in my two cents. I, I genuinely appreciate that. 
and Mrs. King, did we have time to find out anything about the monies from the cemetery board on, on the uh, mowing contract, which runs out? This is the last year for that contract. And I uh, checked on the amount of taxes that are collected, and that's why the uh, council only budgeted $26,000 because basically the tax income from the assessment on the citizens of this county will be $25,690, I think, so it doesn't even come to $26,000. So they gave us some extra money from somebody uh, for the commission, for the cemetery commission. And uh, as you well know, the contract does, uh, Moy contract pretty well covers that. And we talked to Mr. France, I think it was yesterday, uh, and he is aware of uh, the concerns of the cemetery board. And some of those are legitimate, some of them aren't. Uh, but it's still the commissioner's job to check on Mr. France and not the cemetery board. So we will be trying to see what's going on. He can't get in those fields when they're soaking wet. And uh, we had a lot of wet weather last year, and I think that was the reason one of the cemeteries that they were complaining about hadn't been mowed because of the fact that he couldn't even get to it because of going through uh, wet fields and such as that. So uh, there needs to be a little bit of give on both sides on that one, I think. But things are pretty well set, and there's not, the money's just not there. And we can't spend it if we don't have it. Oh, really? It's true. Mary, true. I, I know that. My, my first year in office, uh, uh, I think the uh, budget for the uh, Cemetery Commission uh, the tax dollars was in the low 40s, low to mid 40s. Yes. And uh, that's dropped, as, as she said, to 26,000. So it's basically cut pretty much like 40 to 45%. Right. And uh, so. Uh, we're making do with the best we can, but uh, if the monies aren't well, there, the, the monies aren't there. Right, and I understand all that, Frank, and uh, you know that uh, everybody's squeezing those pennies and nickels <coughs> to make ends meet, and I know the county's not in the best shape financially, and, and uh, the RAV goes down every year, you know, our assessed value, and but uh, I just found it hard for the cemetery board to meet and function when 95% of their budget's going for mowing. You know, it doesn't leave them any money for anything. And, and they, I, I just wondered about, you know, why so much going to one gentleman for mowing, and well, which to leave the uh, cemetery right. board penniless. That contract is, a, if, I, if I remember correctly, a three-year contract yes. was approved. Uh, the board has taken the initiative to uh, try and get certain clubs to uh, assist them financially. They are uh, trying to do other uh, fundraising efforts in, to make up for the shortfall right. for the things that they need to do. And uh, so uh, it's, it's like everything else, when money's not there you try alternatives and uh, and I think the board has, they approached me two, three weeks ago and we sat down and talked and, and uh, they talked about some of the things they wanted to do and everything like that. So uh, an effort is being made because those cemeteries are, uh, for some people that don't understand the, the history associated with them, but a lot of people lie in those cemeteries who helped us be where we are today. And, sure. and uh, but, there are there are a few cemeteries that they know that there are graves there, but there are no markers. But overall, there are 108 or 110 pioneer cemeteries in Fayette County, and some of them are on private land, which really can't be accessed from the road. Some of them are tiny plots with with stones that uh, can barely be read anymore, if they can be read at all, and. Uh, it's simply just not possible to each week, and, and I know you know this, to take care of 110 cemeteries. Oh, very true. But, but they are doing the best that they can. They've done some rehab work on some of the cemeteries. 
uh, put up some flagpoles and, and etc. And but it's going to take a long time for everything to be brought up to snuff. But the work is continuing. And they are looking for volunteers. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Any other patron concerns? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, Leroy. I just got one. I was coming down here mainly for that meeting that didn't happen because of the service officer. I'm one of those veterans that when I was working, I would call him and tell him that, you know, I couldn't be there till like four o'clock and he would come back down there and open that place up and help me. And we spent six, seven months on my reevaluation and finally through his lots of paperwork and stuff, and I got reevaluated and my VA rating got changed. And like I say, he goes out of his way to help the veterans, you know. I mean, they might, I call down there and he might not be there, but you leave a message and he'll call you back within a day or two when he gets a chance. And like I said, I spent six, seven months getting reevaluated. And every time I needed him, I'd call him and he would come down there after hours and open up so we could get this stuff done. And like he said, I don't know where this woman come up with her facts and figures, but it's just not true. So, thank you, sir. Like some other issues, we hear the negative, we don't hear the positive. Yeah, we want to thank well, like I said, he goes out of his way to help. Them. So, Very thank good. you, Leroy. <laughs> sir, would you state your name, please? Mm -hmm. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jason Waterman, I'm a resident of the county. Um, I also am a forester with the Department of Natural Resources. And about a year ago, the uh, commissioners uh, approved some forestry work done up at Manla Park, uh, some post-harvest work to help the species out there generate properly so we can get good stocking in the woodlands. Um, and at that meeting, I had promised I would go out and inspect the work and report back when it was done, that the stuff was done properly. And, that was accomplished um, late February. And so the work was done. I went out there. Everything looks really good. The forest uh, species that we're targeting to try to get to regenerate will do so now. Uh, and we'll have a good legacy to pass on to future Bay County residents. What I need to bring to your attention today is that while I was out at the park, I found a tree that, for all intents and purposes, is infested with emerald ash borer. Um, I got in touch with the division of uh, the DNR Division of Entomology, and they're uh, in the process of actually confirming that. Uh, but regardless, the emerald ash borer is very close to Manland Park, if, it, if that is actually there. And in the next several years, the ash trees that are in the campground and around the, uh, the buildings and everything else will be killed by that bug. And uh, that's a, obviously a safety issue, safety concern, and I do not know exactly the wording that's in the uh, agreement between the county and the uh, conservation club as far as who's in charge of what in terms of maintenance, upkeep, who's to pay for things, but there are tr ash trees close to the building and in the campsites that will have to be removed simply from a safety perspective at some point in time over the next few years, and I just wanted to bring that up that it's on your radar. Are we, t tell me what the normal procedure is if the way you're talking you're 100% sure that these trees will be infected? Yes. <clears throat> Are we ahead of the game to take them down now or? Uh, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, Yes and no. <laughs> it really, a lot of it, obviously, it depends upon budgeting. Um, now, there was a, a timber sale at, at Man Love Park a couple of years ago and uh, pulled in roughly about $28,000, which was uh, supposed to have been set aside in a dedicated fund for park maintenance and that type of thing. And that uh, those funds were used to fund the forestry work that I had just mentioned. Um, but the at Emerald Ash Borer is absolutely lethal to every single species of ash tree that we have. Um, there's one species, blue ash, that has some resistance to it, but it, that is killed as well. Um, most of the ash that's up there is white ash, which is very, very susceptible. So for all practical purposes, every single ash tree is going to be killed. Now, do you need to run out there and get these trees removed now? No. Um, 
it takes a few years for the damage to be seen and the trees to actually die. Um, so, I mean, you will have some visual, say, ooh, that tree's not in very good condition anymore, type of thing. And they don't all die all at once. The, the trees, uh, the bug usually kills the trees that are most stressed first. So one tree will look uh, in poor condition while the tree next to it looks perfectly fine. Um, it only goes after ash trees, though. So the other species that are there are going to be perfectly fine. What about, what about <clears throat> the value of the tree? If if a tree that's not infected today, mm -hmm. if it were cut down today as far as its value for uh, for sale, okay, is it is it compromised if once the ash borer gets into it, is the wood less valuable than it is if it's not compromised? Um, <clears throat> well, any trees that could be safely dropped uh, were included in the, the timber harvest from okay. a couple of years ago. So the trees that are left uh, there's a few scattered in the woods, but the, they're not that big of a deal, really. It's the ones that are closer to the, the infrastructure that's the issue. And those just couldn't be safely removed during a timber harvest because of their proximity to power lines and structures and things. So this would, these trees would have to be removed piecemeal uh, by a, a you know, tree removal company. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> um, the wood is perfectly fine, so it, you could recoup that in like firewood sales or something like that if you wanted to go that route. Um, or, you know, however the conservation club, you know, what, whatever the details of that would be. But, um, yeah, this is something that could end up being rather costly. I don't know the number of trees that would be entailed with this. It's just, it's looming on the horizon, and I wanted it uh, to be brought to your attention before it would end up becoming a safety issue and we'd have to, you know, really scramble and get something done quickly. I know, I mean, every city, every county, everybody is, is dealing with this all across the eastern United States. And there are some treatments that can be applied to individual trees to uh, essentially inject them with insecticides to uh, prevent them from dying from, from the bug. But those treatments have to be uh, reapplied every other year, so it's an ongoing expense. And uh, some of the the training sessions that the DNR has, has provided to uh, municipalities and, and uh, counties have suggested that using that these treatments as a way to stretch out those dollars over time for, for tree removal uh, might be you know feasible um, instead of paying huge money up front for you know removing a bunch of trees, spend some on injections and, and some on removal and spread it out a little bit, but. Like I said, I just wanted to bring this up so that you know you're aware this is something that's going to come down the pike. Okay. May I ask a question? Please. In some of the eastern counties, mm -hmm. east of Indiana and states, they have actually set a quarantine because of the spread of it. Mm. We and tried. It doesn't work. Is that work. something that would be a consequence work. here in our county? We actually were under quarantine for a while. Um, when the emerald ash borer was first discovered, the uh, DNR put up township quarantines and then county quarantines wherever we found the, the, the bug. Uh, of course, quarantines are only as good as the people that follow it. And the more we looked, the more we found it. And uh, if you had a map of Indiana, it just lit up like a Christmas tree with all the, the various spots we found it. And so the, uh, the quarantine has now essentially become a statewide quarantine uh, so that, you know, in theory, you're not supposed to transfer it across state lines, but the, the county and, and township quarantines have been removed. Um, incidentally, this isn't the only place that ash borer is found in the county. It was confirmed over by Alquina about a year ago. Um, it's in Union County, it's in Wayne County, it's in Rush County, it's in Franklin County. It's, you know, it's it's everywhere. Uh, it's going to get here regardless. It's just a matter of when. So the ash tree so. will be gone. Has it been found in Brown County? Yes. I was just in Bower County in another meeting yet uh, last week, and it's it's definitely there. So, does Brown County still have restrictions on the wood you're allowed to take into the parks in Brown County? The parks do still require you to have certified EAB-free firewood, yes, and that would go for Brookville and, and all the other state-run facilities. Okay. So, Ms. Walkman, I thank you. Um, after we're about ready to adjourn here in a moment. I have a 
little project I'd like to talk to you about. Do you have the time to yeah. stay for a few minutes? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other paper from sir? If not, I'll entertain a motion for the approval of payroll and claims. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second for the approval of payroll and claims. Question? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Three ayes. If there's no further business, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to adjourn. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Three ayes.